Hello and welcome to Up Close with Upward. Today our guest is, he hails from a lineage of Vedic scholars and uh, Agnihotris uh, who moved on to secular occupations just a generation back. He is also a researcher, an activist, a social entrepreneur and the author of Brahmin Genocide, the precursor to Hindu extinction. Uh, welcome, Malingam Balaji. Shri Guru Bhyo Namaste. Namaste, Ashish Ji. Welcome Namaste to Upward View. Welcome to Upward, sir. And uh, we are so glad to have you to have this conversation on this very important book. I went through the book cover to cover and I think you've done a fantastic job. And I hope that this interview gives us a chance to acquaint the viewers with uh, your analysis and the insights that you have derived from your own research and study on this uh, terrifying uh, subject. Um, so I'll start with the title itself, Brahmin Genocide, and uh, you have subtitled it as Precursor to Hindu Extinction. And I think many people would, you know, on the face of it, people would laugh on reading the subtitle. They would accuse you of indulging in fear mongering and uh, sensationalism to boost the sales of your book. Uh, so what do you have to say to that? Uh, what I'm asking you to do here is to expand on the premise, the basic premise of the book, because I think the subtitle Precursor to Hindu Extinction captures what you want to say in the book. So, Great, sir. Thank you, Ji. <clears throat> First is the part about the word genocide. The word genocide has been used after careful evaluation of fact and application of mind. So, the, I will take the second question also in terms of, is it done for publicity sake? It is done for exaggeration. There is a model, eight stage model, global model, which has been used for genocide and it has been expanded to 10 stages. It has been done by Professor uh, Stanton, Dr. Stanton. And this model is being prevalent for almost, I think, 40, 50 years. And for each of these stages, there is a characteristic. So the stages goes like symbolization, classification, discrimination, dehumanization, like that. There are 10 stages, polarization. Like that. So what we have done is we have mapped the current status of the Brahmin the community to each of these characteristics. And we have also created a website by name www.brahmingenocide.org mm. Maybe you can put it in the captions uh, later when you sure. publish it. So, viewers can actually go, anybody who has got an internet and a, a phone can Google set this website. In that website, we have documented the genocide model. We have also documented the 10 stages and how it applies to the Brahmin community. So, this way, uh, people don't have to buy a book uh, to get this information. So that also takes the uh, kind of uh, issue that is it done for exaggeration, it is done for publicity because they, we have done this as a part of this effort to bring attention. Coming to the genocide part of it as such, in the pre-independence era, during the time of invasion, there has been some uh, assaults on the Brahmin community which we have documented in the book. In the post-independent era, after all, <coughs> we got independence in 1947, the first uh, issue which happened to the Brahmin community was in the aftermath of Mahatma Gandhiji's assassination. What happened in uh, Chitpavan Brahmins in Maharashtra is a massacre. We can call it as a kind of a genocide as well. And the second uh, bigger issue which happened in 1990, obviously, is uh, what happened to our uh, Kashmiri Pandit community as well. And even in the 1947 uh, time, there are reports that in some states, people have told us, uh, leaders have told that they have to go on All India Radio and then request the uh, uh, general public not to attack any Brahmins or make sure that the Brahmin community is safe. So they have actually taken the initiative is what they say and we are very thankful because uh, we don't uh, want any human loss of life and if they have done it, it is good. But it also tells us that all it requires maybe is that they are small spark 
and there seems to be some kind of an undercurrent of a potential hate against Brahmin. All that it requires is a spark to lit. So we don't want that to be lit because of all the social media, fake news and all this happening in the 21st century. So we have put this as a genocide, not because it is inevitable or it is going to happen, but we want the entire community to be alerted, the entire Bharatiya civilization to be alerted so that we all work together to solve an issue before it really becomes a reality. That is our vision today. Because uh, genocide should not happen to not just Brahmin community, but to any community is our position. I hope I answered your question. Um, partially. Uh, I would like you to go further into the subtitle specifically because you have said that it is a precursor to Hindu extinction. Why do you say Great. that? Great question. So, what in the book we have documented is that the hate speech against Brahmins has been going on for now close to more than 200 years, uh, 250 plus 300 years. And this has started during the colonial era. And when it started, uh, it was focused towards the Brahmin community because it was felt at that time that Brahmins were the traditional knowledge system custodians. Hence, this was a battle for civilization. And hence, since Brahmins seem to be at the edge of this civilizational battle, they were a target. Mm. After the independence, some of the colonial stooges seem to have taken the same agenda for their own <coughs> uh, whatever interest they have. So, this is the battle for saving the traditional knowledge systems of our country and for Bharatiya civilization. Having said that, is this a property of one exclusive community? No. The civilization belongs to each and every one of us. It is not a property of one particular community. So, what will happen is that whatever is being targeted towards Brahmin, if it succeeds, it is going to come to each and every community. Why? Because each and every community takes their values, their values, their rituals, their practices and their civilizational memory to the next generation. Hence, everyone has a stake in this civilization. So, each will be targeted until the civilization is completely annihilated. That is why we say that the ultimate objective of Brahmin hate speech is Hindu extinction and annihilation of Bharatiya civilization. Brahmins just happen to be in the way and they are being targeted first. So that is why we have put in the tagline saying it is a precursor to Hindu extinction and we should not make it happen. And if we address the hate speech issue for Brahmin community, we can use the same template to make sure that hate against other communities is also uh, kind of handled because mm -hmm. Hate speech per se has we should have zero tolerance for any person or for any community against, mm -hmm. right? Not just for Brahmins. Whatever we are learning here, we will be applying it for other communities to make sure that we live in a hate-free environment. That is our vision and that is our uh, goal. Mm -hmm. okay. Did I answer the question? Yes. Thank so, you. so you just touched upon the slightly the roots of this hatred against Brahmins. Uh, can you go a little deeper into that? Uh, sure. Yeah. So, where did this start from and why does it persist to this day? Great. So, in our research which we have documented in the book, there is a writing which we came across uh, in a research paper that in the year 1799, a Dutch uh, magazine has written uh, about the world. Right? It was introducing the world to children in the age of 10 to 15 years. And there, there is this narrative about Indian caste system, Hindu caste system. There is a narrative about Brahmins is the lazy and then, you know, it talks about other Varnas and all this. And then they say the Brahmin uh, is the living the, like a life of what they call it, the lazy Brahmin. And that right, they are the most uh, highest position. Whatever we are seeing today has been kind of, I would say in a way, portrayed in about 300 years back. The question which comes to us is, what would have been the knowledge sources for somebody to write this in 1799? How much of Sanskrit literature was translated? How much do the people know about Dwarf? In our view, I think mostly it would have been from traveler's account or from some trader's account or some, some hearsay. But 
if somebody is writing it to a children 10 to 15 years of age, that means that there is a pattern and that pattern has been set long back. The second reason is while that was there, after I believe somewhere around we can argue around 1857 onwards, the colonial rulers had another mission. They had to justify their rule of India by saying that this is a barbaric civilization and that they need to kind of civilize the native nation. And you have seen all those campaigns about uh, Sati and others. And I think Dr. Meenachi Singh's book also talks about how there were dif distinct phases when the whole uh, narrative changes into that. So the Brahmin hatred also because of that fact that they believed that there is a false religion and the priests of the religion, which they felt were the Brahmin community, they were leading people into this false religion and hence they need to be attacked so that they, they can save and civilize the uh, rest of the population. So that is where the roots of the uh, Brahmin hate speech happen. Okay. And why, do, why does that hate speech persist even today? Because you have in the book shown there, there is an organic link between what was written 300 years back, for example, yeah. and the same templates, the same tropes, the same kind of vilification continues to happen uh, even today. So what is that link? Why, why does it persist? Great. I will take a slightly uh, elaborate answer to that if it is okay yes, with you. <clears throat> so the way we have documented it in the book is that we see it as a multi-layered attack on the civilization. It started with othering of the community of Brahmins by saying that there were the Aryan invaders versus there were the natives. Second is to say that they were the natives where there is this Dasyus and uh, hmm. Dasas which was kind of portrayed as the indigenous people being subjugated. Okay. So now the head castle gets built brick by brick as you can see. Now the third phase it says that, okay, now they came in, they subjugated the native population and third is they started discriminating. That is when they started uh, <coughs> utilizing the Hindu scriptures and then misreading them, plus also uh, creating the entire caste narrative. The fourth phase or layer in which they built this was to say that they denied opportunity. So as you see, the hate level starts progressing because here is a person, if I am a person who is reading this, I will say, hey, there's somebody came from, who was not even belonging to the son of the soil. He comes, they invade us, uh, they kind of subjugate us. Now, not only that they discriminated against us, now they also denied opportunity. Now, the stack is almost getting complete. Plus, now they also started adding, which you will see in the newer thing, which is to say that they, uh, some of the practices are not environmental, these are barbaric and others. So, this is the... Now, this is a newer version of the attack which is happening into that. So, when we go back into this four, what happened after the colonial era was there were, in our opinion, colonial stooges who were, even in the British were supporting them during the later phase of, I think, the 1920, 1910 onwards to until the freedom struggle. And these were actually propagating their ideologies in different parts of India. And after the colonial powers left, they started pushing it for their own self-interest, for their own political gains and sometimes they were even getting funding from abroad. Plus, we also felt that the academic discourse has not changed. So, essentially, whatever has been said there as an academic research saying that this happened, this caste discrimination happened, the denial of opportunity happened, that just gets getting repropagated. That is the second part. Now, there is a third part what has happened is now the last 40-50 years, in our opinion, there has not been much robust challenge to this entire narrative set. The, has there been a lot of attempts? Yes. In our opinion, yes. But was there a cohesive attempt at all ways to, uh, attach, to address this issue? I'm sorry. <coughs> I, we don't find much evidence to that. And the second or third generation of independent India's uh, <coughs> children have started, some of them started believing in this narrative themselves. So they themselves are unwittingly kind of propagating this, saying that we read it in the textbooks, we read it here, we read it in every source which we can get off. It looks like there has been discrimination, there has been denial of opportunities. <clears throat> so let me put it up front here. We are not saying that any discrimination should be supported or we are not uh, we are not here to whitewash any discrimination per se. So 
anybody cannot be discriminated there should be no grounds on any on any way having said that a lot of what has been written is there any primary evidence to it so we are just seeking that so i think that will be a very fair thing for us to seek and we have to seek that information primary sources so then we learn from it that's what did i but to you? the uh, if if you go by the primary sources as you've shown in the book the picture that emerges is quite to the contrary where uh, for example the pioneering work by shri dharmpal correct uh, that you have thrown some light on in the book it clearly shows the composition of uh, you know the students in schools and that education was not really uh, the you know the sole domain of the brahmins as they keep alleging right. so um, so yeah i mean if we go by the primary sources then the kind of picture that emerges is completely uh, the opposite that's correct uh before we move on uh, you said another thing in your opening remarks this was about uh this was about the violence against brahmins in independent india uh violence or hatred or political pressure or oppression uh i believe that a lot of willful disbelief and uh, and the convenient skepticism that uh you must be facing about oh you know you're just fear mongering and things like that i think that would go away if if you can just recall from the top of your mind uh a few instances of uh of violence against brahmins in independent india which although they've been documented also they are part of you know their objective history uh, they seem to miss the popular narrative so some instances other than the one that you already mentioned so sure. <clears throat> See, on the top of my mind, one characteristic which I think I am, we are noticing in our work is that, while there has been instances of massacre throughout the world, right? Unfortunate reality of the world is that there is hate and there is some massacre happening in India. At least in the post-independent India, what we see is that it never never become a mainstream discourse as to a how many people got affected by it. do we have robust data on that for maharashtrian uh, what happened in the aftermath of mahatma gandhi's assassination uh, we are not finding any primary evidence to say that this many number of people were impacted and this is the remedial measures which are taken by the government and after that is there any kind of a learning is there any uh, what way what they call as a post mortem uh, analysis to say that why did this happen what do we learn as a country together so that we don't have you see this issue happening over there and not just about brahmin i would also say that it happened in the anti sikh riots where our sikh brothers were also uh, impacted but again uh, is there substantial uh, data to say that this many number of uh, sikh community brothers and sisters got affected what is the remedial measures which has been taken and what has been done to address the wounds of the community and how uh, we have learned from that to make sure that we are a better society same for kashmiri pandits uh, exodus as well so this uh, to us is a, uh, i think it's an area of concern because the way i see it is we are living in a kind of a joint family system right i can say it's a huge one big huge family which is what we have agreed on after 1947 and each family has its own room you can say each community or each province you can visualize it as they are living in independent rooms But if there is some problem happening to one community, it doesn't mean that the others will have to close their doors and wait. I think a healthy joint family system means that that should be brought into the living room. All members of the family have to sit together to say, "Hey, this is something happened to one of our brothers. Let's have this conversation." And the government should, in our view, should be the and the civil society should take the lead and the government as well to make sure that they learn from it and then they address it. And my mind at least from what i have searched so far i don't see that as a robust evidence that we are seeing that happening so have you come across anything like that that as as that kind of a post mortem come white paper you no know, there are still it? there are still uh, witnesses who are alive to that uh, to that massacre uh, but there is 
<clears throat> nothing official that you will find even in the case of our community kashmiri pandits uh, there are no clear numbers uh, even the number of people who moved out from the valley uh, are the number is severely underreported uh, i mean the official figures are something like 1 lakh and just a basic count of you know since i belong to the community it is very clear that it is closer to half a million so there is under reporting there is uh, you know uh, some sort of a suppression of facts and there is most importantly no uh, acknowledgement no official acknowledgement by the state by the government of india of what transpired in the late 80s and early 90s in kashmir and uh, that i think has a very long term consequence um, we might have articles written by people we might have videos we might even have a movie now um but those do not go towards um towards validating facts they will not be counted as facts they may influence the narrative temporarily but once the people once people of my generation which is the last i suppose who ha- saw the actual ethnic cleansing taking place once we don't uh, once we are gone uh, i think it will be very difficult to make a case for what happened there unlike un- unlike the case of jews which got very you know very well documented and everyone knew what exactly went went on and what followed in terms of building the popular narrative through movies and art and other stuff uh, was based on these actual reports so i i'm sure you know i've spoken with uh, vivek agnihotri about this uh, you know off the uh, off camera and he, he had a lot of trouble in getting uh, actual data right so so that actually brings me to the next question uh, and i'd actually like to go through each stage of genocide uh, this sure. what we are discussing is the 10th stage actually the denial of genocide let's get this is very pertinent because uh, after after annihilating an entire community uh, the most brutal uh, step of genocide is actually to say that oh nothing happened correct so uh, would you mind if i read each stage of the genocide sure and if you could explain how that applies to brahmins fine huh. right so i'll take this table 3.1 from page 34 of your book and huh. so genocide stage is classification and the characteristic is that there is a division of us and them typically carried out using stereotypes so how is it relevant to correct so <clears throat> first is if i may take an extra 30 seconds there but one important point about this genocide model is that they say that the stages can operate simultaneously and sometimes they can also happen in a repetitive way right so it's not like a linear staircase model that one stage opened then second stage was there mm. so there is no complete transition like mm. that i'm sure you were aware of that just for the benefit of our viewers so the first stage stage we talk about is classification mm. it's about us versus them narrative the immediate thing you can think of is the aryan versus or uh, native population right. and this brahmins came in and that they were actually part of the aryan tribe and they actually suppressed the indigenous people right and that is how exactly that fits in into that template right. and that gets played in as the outsiders coming into the scene right. that's the aspect is that so then there is the symbolization which yes. is the visual manifestation of hatred that's correct the visual manifestation of hatred is that brahmins do have a traditional attire they have the shika they have their religious markings on their forehead so they do get immediately identified by that and that becomes and their genayu sometimes you have heard of even genayus being uh, cut in some sort right. so these are the visual manifestations of the symbolic right 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 then there is discrimination that the dominant group denies civil rights to identified groups okay. so there are uh, open calls for even uh, even in electoral uh, you know what would i say that right in the, in the arena of politics mm-hmm. i would put there have been calls of you know can we not polarize people 
reign against the brahmins right if brahmins are a particular community we don't we just for you know polarize the rest mm-hmm. of the society against them peddling a narrative in the, in, in that in the name of getting votes in the name of getting votes or in the name of uh, uh, they have to show an enemy uh, and that enemy is can be any every problem of society is kind of put into as this kind of a brahmin created or generated issue and then they kind of vilification start so that they try to use to kind of bring in their followers mm. to have a common enemy so brahmin conveniently fits the bill there right. Right? i'm not saying that all everybody is doing it but we do see instances of it and we have kind of documented some yeah. in the book the next the fourth stage is dehumanization which is targeted groups are treated with no forms of human rights or personal dignity yeah and in this dehumanization uh, it's a very important step because uh, what the model also talks about is that every human being has a natural aversion for violence and for killing right? every all of us want to live as brothers and sisters together so by dehumanizing then they are taking away that moral uh, feeling of hey i cannot do harm to a human being to my fellow countrymen right so by equating them to dogs to parasites to pests right? have you not heard of brahmins being caricatured as pets uh, pests and then like living off the yeah. uh, others like parasites yeah, one right? of the illustrations in your book also shows that uh, right. the, it's been depicted as a snake correct yeah and so this this kind of symbolism and try to get them to be dehumanization is a stage where they kind of make they kind of take the threshold to say that hey these people are not really human mm-hmm. so that is the dehumanization part the fifth stage is organization right. and uh, the characteristic is that regimes of hatred often train those who go on to carry out the destruction of targeted people right so in our book we have shown evidence of how the brahmin hate propaganda is well funded and well trained people are trained and there are videos where which are apparently coming from outside of india where uh, people are spending a lot of time and money to create these video with uh, false propaganda right so these are kind of uh, symbols of organization difference. level of right. organization which gets into it the sixth stage is polarization propaganda begins to be spread by hate groups yeah so these are calls where uh, even Uh, the polarization is where they even start talking about hey we should do something about this can we kind of uh, you know calls for genocide sometimes they happen small minor yeah, attacks these, these are stages where you see that uh, symbols of polarization where you can you can see signs of this happening and this is again to polarize and then to bring them to a stage that hey the existence of one this community they are creating so much trouble right and they this problem needs to be sorted out so from a fellow human being a community gets addressed to a problem which has to be sorted out uh, level mm-hmm. so that is where the polarization idea the next step is polarization uh, and the characteristic is propaganda begins to be spread by hate groups and this is a stage where now we see social media there are a lot of calls again because previously uh, without the social media not much of a propagation we can see but now with social media being there you can see uh, there is a targeting of uh, brahmin community vilification campaigns is all this is part of this world right so stage. it's basically uh, the output of the organized groups organized group that's that correct. is polarization that's a very good way of looking at right. it absolutely correct uh, uh, the seventh stage is preparation mm. Uh, perpetrators plan the genocide they often use euphemisms to cloak their intentions han so in this stage what happens is we have uh, calls for genocide which keep happening and uh, small uh, identification using coded language and then using message head messages all these kind of uh, phenomenons do happen so this has been also documented in the book uh, where there have been uh, calls for genocide randomly another so which have also been addressed okay hmm. the eighth is persecution where victims are identified because of their ethnicity or religion and death lists are drawn up ah uh, this is the stage where there is a kind of what we call as a just the stage before the actual genocides are carried out hate lists are being drawn off and where uh, targeted groups are identified i think uh, 
<clears throat> coming in uh, in the Kashmir example, we have uh, seen that being being happening. So this is when this is almost the uh, at this stage they say that this, the genocide is just in the next step, which mm. is around that. And again, just to point to our viewers that at every stage of it, uh, there are control measures which are possible. But once the physical violence starts happening, it becomes very it becomes too quick to mm. spread, right? So at every stage, we have to be watchful, and that's why it, they say that. In this case, uh, prevention is always the better than Kuru. You use the same, uh, what, you, what do they say, the cliched word, but here it is very, very important. Okay. It is rather we be watchful about it and err on the side of caution. That mm. is what is the advice I will give. Mm. And the ninth is extermination. Yeah. Hate groups murder their identified victims in a deliberate and systematic campaign of violence. In, in this unfortunate uh, situation, what happens is a, a member of a community just gets targeted just for being he being he or she being a member of the community. There is no personal like dislike over here because this has now become like a mob uh, kind of a thing. That is how the genocide stage is, and I think uh, this has happened in in the few genocides which we have seen across in the Bharat, right, where the individuals uh, may or may not even be kind of. Uh, adhering to that ideology, they may actually be very secular in nature, they may even be atheist, they may not even practice the faith, but they just get targeted for uh, their name or for their particular identity. Hmm. That's, that's how it is. I think uh, when you mention, hmm. okay, before that, the last stage we've already discussed is denial, yeah. which uh, I think is an everyday reality as far as this issue is concerned. That's correct. <clears throat> so here, um, the examples that you gave, twice or thrice you mentioned Kashmiri Pandits. Yeah. And um, you know it could be argued both ways. But was it that Kashmiri Pandits were targeted because they were Hindus uh, or whether they were Brahmins? Uh, what do you think? I'll also share my perspective. Um, ji, uh, I don't uh, have a... Uh, sorry, in a, in a way I'll put it this way that this is unfortunate because I see them as both Pandits and Hindus and Indians all together, right? So this is all three uh, to us. It is very difficult in my mind to make that distinction to say whether this was because of this or because of that. But to me, what has happened is our Pandit brothers and sisters uh, were innocent. Uh, they got targeted for no fault of them. And their pain, uh, I can only kind of verbalize it, but I, I will never be able to really truly feel it and I will be dishonest if I say that I can feel it because they have lived in their ancestral homes for the hundreds of years and then suddenly one fine morning they are asked to leave that. So that pain uh, and wounds uh, still remain unfortunately, I am sorry. You come from that community so you possibly will know more about it. Well, I would like yeah, to my, hear your perspective. <laughs> my perspective on this is that uh, the pundits were targeted for being Hindus. Mm -hmm. And they were driven out mm -hmm. because they were idol worshippers. Idol worshippers. Okay. But uh, we've not got justice because we are Brahmins. Okay. So the last stage of the genocide, uh, which is denial, is applicable especially because we are Brahmins. Okay. Had we been a different community, I think uh, the denial would have not happened so blatantly. That is my perspective. Okay. Now, <clears throat> moving on, uh, writing about Brahmophobia social media implications in one of the chapters, you state, and I quote, frequent and repetitive exposure to Brahmin hate propaganda will eventually result in desensitizing other community groups to Brahmin hate. Sorrel Aol in their studies explored the effects of exposure to hate speech on outgroup prejudice. Following the general aggression model, they suggest that frequent and repetitive exposure to hate speech leads to desensitization okay. to this form of verbal violence and subsequently to lower evaluations of the victims and greater distancing, thus increasing outgroup prejudice. This is a lot of sociological and technical jargon in here i would like to i would like you to um, maybe tone it down a little and explain to us what this means uh, uh, the simp uh, the way i would put it is that initially 
if uh, it takes say small doses of the head being fed so uh, once there is a reaction okay something say in some part of india there is some something head happening there then after a period of time we see okay more then there is more then over a period of time the mind begins to kind of tune into that to say hey this is you no know, a par for the course right this happens you know like example like um, <clears throat> i can put it in a simple way if you see that in the neighborhood say two families are having a small fight when the first time it happened there is a lot of curiosity people do on it after 10 days then uh, what happened there is a bit of disintegration then after if they start repetitively yeah. doing that after two months then you find that there is some uh, small fight happening you don't really bother like what hai yaar you know it keeps happening right let's not they will kind of manage it right so same that is what we call as the desensitization because frequent exposure and then it is happening there so people start expecting that to happen the mm. mind starts tuning to happen but what they are saying is each time it happens then the heat level threshold is also going up so we need to keep that in mind mm. that's what they say frequent and repeated exposure so for them to get sensitive then there needs to be something more substantially happening right. than what was happening initially right 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 so this this um constant verbal aggression mm. against brahmins can you give some examples of how this like in the in your chapter 5 of your book is everyday brahmophobia correct okay. right uh, and you give numerous examples of hate speech against brahmins um if you can recall some examples sure. for our viewers so what we have told in the book is about two things one is also about the techniques which are being used because the brahmophobia is getting sophisticated in the sense that uh, they use certain techniques hmm. to bring attention uh, to the brahmin hate right not explicitly but sometimes even in a indirect way we have shown some uh, common techniques but what we have also shown in the book is that there are variety of sources from which brahmophobia seems to be coming if you take mainstream media yes there are instances of uh, brahmin hate caricaturing of brahmins all these are happening if you take uh, some public personalities they come back and then they use the word uh, <clears throat> of kind of brahmin hate in a indirect manner sometimes or sometimes even in a direct manner because unknowingly or knowingly we don't know their intention but what we see is brahmophobia and we have even given a quick test just to make sure that uh, we are not overreacting at the same time we can't decide 100% but at least if you see a article or a cartoon or something you can have use this uh, quick test to say hey does it look brahmophobic then our response is please go and challenge it please go and ask the person to explain himself or herself and then decide rather than ignoring it because hate should not be ignored we should if you find it hateful go challenge the person ask them what is their perspective get their view and then you decide so give us some position. examples <clears throat> some examples i will put it like saying uh, a common tool is to take any historical or any current even and then say hey brahmins are behind it mm. because it's a conspiracy theory you know so both mm. no? so how do you prove that it is uh, it is that the second is to use a word like a brahminical to something something happening it is because of brahminical thing okay. and then smash you, brahminical patriarchy ha uh, that could be a, one, one real version of it yeah. right but it more, possibly is more uh, i think it was more aimed towards patriarchy patriarchy or brahminical i am not sure right how it was but the word brahminical and if we ask some of them they try to use the uh, quote of uh, dr b r ambedkar ji to say that hey brahminical is the word used by them actually we have also documented in the book that dr b r ambedkar ji has mentioned he has defined in one of his speeches he has used this word that is what we find in the in the ministry of uh, uh, i think uh, social justice has published all his speeches we find the evidence of it in one speech he has said that by brahminical i do not mean the power privilege or interests of the brahmin community i am not uh, using that uh, word in that sense at all right i am using that word in the sense of uh, negation of spirit of equality liberty fraternity in that sense it prevails in all classes but uh, brahmins have been the originators of it that is how he has defined it in his view and dr ambedkar has been very uh, clear in what he meant by that yeah, but then the word but then i mean this originates from dr ambedkar itself then I mean, when you're saying that when he says that this originates from the brahmins then he's already paved that path to pinning all sorts of evils onto brahmins no 
he has used the word classes. It is prevalent in all classes, is what he has said. But it originates Second, in Brahmins. And in his view, and our counterpoint to that is actually today, uh, Dr. Ambedkar uh, might have used it in one sense and he has used it in only one place. So we do not have the context to it. I, neither do I have the knowledge to kind of uh, kind of think what Dr. Ambedkar might have visualized. Right? He is a great personality. Right? Leaving that aside, what we are seeing is now current discourse what is happening. Today you see coronavirus. When it started, it, it happened in a place called Wuhan. Right? When immediately everybody in the world said, see, we, have, we should not kind of put it in one place because it originated maybe in that place, we don't know, we know. But we should call it, we don't want to kind of caricature that place, we don't want to kind of get mm -hmm. a negative impression of that place. Let's call it as COVID-19. Right? The world has moved on into this. So even if Dr. Ambedkar has said that, if, if he is, uh, you know, unfortunately he is not with us anymore, if he is with us, he would have used the same terminology to say that, hey, I may, I may, in my view, it has come from them, but let's not use this to kind of, uh, kind of villainize a community, which is what is happening today. He might have said that, let's use another term. Mm -hmm. And uh, he is such a great personality that he might have been open to that debate there. So I think we should move on into that. And many people who are using this term today are using it as an indirect attack on uh, Brahmin, because when many articles where I have explained there in at least in one or two, they talk about Brahminical and then they suddenly will talk about Brahmins. Right? Mm -hmm. They use the word interchangeably. Uh, Dr. Ambedkar has been very clear that he has not used that word in that sense. Right? Mm -hmm. He says it's prevalent in all classes. He didn't even use the word caste. Mm -hmm. Let's take the example of, uh, I think one of the examples I have quoted there is uh, smash Brahminical patriarchy. Is the word, right? That Twitter CEO came into, uh, the Rex CEO is not the CEO now I guess. So, he came and then he has apparently held a placard saying smash Brahminical patriarchy. Mm. Now, when we look at uh, this, there are two things about it. <clears throat> a, what is the focus there? Is it about patriarchy? If it is about patriarchy, then we did uh, some work on that and uh, what we find is that from anthropologically speaking, there has been no evidence of a matriarchical society which has been documented, fully matriarchical. So, patriarchy has existed in almost all societies. So, what is so special about Brahminical? Right? So, is the focus on Brahminical? That is the next question. Now, apparently the word Brahminical patriarchy comes from a research paper written by Professor Uma Chakravarti. <coughs> right? So, that is what is one of the articles are saying. Then we went and read that paper. So, I don't know whether she has been the originator, but she has at least used the word called a Brahminical Patriarch. Whose paper, when we went through that and then her paper we read through, we trace the word of what is Brahminical Patriarchy. In that Brahminical Patriarchy, there is a paper written by Professor Uma Chakravarti. And it talks about Brahminical Patriarchy. We don't know whether she originated the term, has mm. been claimed in one newspaper, but at least we saw an article which has been written by a, a research mm. paper, so to speak. In that research paper, it refers to a study by Professor New Realman. Mm. So, I went and read through that research paper as well. That is about single East society. <laughs> so, and that uh, has nothing to do with India, but what is distinctly different from Indian society and uh, the single East society is the absence of Brahmin in that society. It is not my word. It has been documented by Professor New Realman as well. So, uh, the whole construct is about closed society, how in the closed environment where the Brahmins uh, are doing this Brahminical patriarchy. If two systems and two societies are closed uh, by having a similar nature and in one society there is Brahmins, in one society there is absence of Brahmins, at the least logically I would assume that Brahmins are not in any way making a difference into that uh, patriarchy. If it is happening in a closed society in Singla as well as this. Now the second thing is Professor New Allman also refers to something about Malaba. So we said, okay, let's do the full research there. We went back into that and I studied that paper on Malabar. That paper on Malabar is written by, I think, uh, Dr. Kathleen Go, if I'm not wrong, my memory serves right. Dr. Kathleen, she has actually visited that place and she has also documented that whatever is the initiation rites, which we, she has, that's about initiation rites, the paper is. She has clearly documented she has not witnessed it first hand. She has captured it from people who say that these rites had existed 40-50 years before. So, they also have not seen it. Okay. So, this is like a 
third person narrative on which he has built a theory mm. and that theory is now gone into a closed society argument and it is about suddenly it has become brahminical patriarchy so we don't find any primary evidence to say that there is this uh, something special about uh, brahminical patriarchy or not so the question which unfortunately which i think was not asked is is the focus of twitter ceo uh, ex twitter ceo rather on uh, patriarchy if yes how many places or countries has he visited how many places has he took up a board a placard saying that i want to smash this country's patriarchy it's like you know brazilian uh, croatia brazilian it's like uh, you know uh, every country seems to have its own cuisine right so say, similarly in my opinion every country has should have some version of patriarchy so which patriarchy apart from indian uh, smash brahminical patriarchy i have not seen any evidence of uh, any other patriarchy being uh, done and And the last point i will say is is about a technique right so somehow in our view that uh, whenever uh, the word brahminical is used right we should just see that is this some kind of a uh, place where we have to kind of uh, think about mm. how to respond i'll give another example which i have quoted in the book right now that we are thinking it just came into my mind something like uh, you know uh, a person may say that right anybody who is brahminical Uh, is automatically anti constitutional if somebody makes a statement like that right example then immediately we our focus should be not to talk about the word brahminical right we should be thinking about what is this constitutional part right and ask them to clarify on that so similarly i think the clarification should have been here asked right or what is this special about brahminical patriarchy what other patriarchies you are trying to address mm. right or is it a worldwide movement you are mm. doing or is it just uh, only for india especially mm. we are doing something about it? Mm. so that i think that part got missed somewhere mm. there the second example <coughs> which i want to give is a reputed ngo uh, international ngos uh, former head he talks about uh, uh, brahmins in two three places uh, in contexts which are totally unrelated he is talking about sunlight is the best disinfectant something like that right and then so this truism came from uh, some but a particular brahmin something like that right and then and then he goes on uh, there is no need to kind of talk about that person's community there in that context right so is it not brahmophobia in our opinion yes it is then it the talks about a particular uh, uh, person a famous personality's family saying that this fa- father does this son does this son does this uh, beauty of brahmins it right? requires uh, careful analysis something like that right so why is beauty of brahmin something like that why the brahmins come into this have they is there any evidence to say that uh, all this being done is because they belong brahmins there is nothing just that individual actions they are taking it to extrapolate it to some more into brahmin which is exactly the definition of brahmophobia we have given where uh, my family may do something or my neighbor's family may do something we may belong to two different communities so there is no need to bring in our communities into this mm. right? it is our individual actions their choices right? Right. you can respectfully disagree with them agree with them argue with them but no need i don't i have no need i have no requirement i have no right to bring anybody else's community uh, into this discussion unless it is really required unless it is, even relevant. if it is required it should not it should be avoided in a pluralistic society ours like ours mm. right and uh, that is our view on that so hence this kind of blatant brahmophobia is something which we need to really kind of uh, address it mm. did i answer your question yeah yeah sorry that was a long answer to a short question no 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 <laughs> <laughs> diving a little deeper into mm. your book in chapter 7 mm. you speak about the road to global brahmin genocide yeah. uh, global being the operative word here so how is it going global how is this brahmophobia getting globalized tell us something more about that yeah uh, two things there one is uh, many uh, especially in the diaspora the nra communities uh, many of them moved from india and some of them in their conversation say that uh, there has been a lot of uh, brahmin hate now we have moved into this society but over a period of last 5 to 10 years they are also seeing that caste discrimination kind of issues have started coming up so in allegations 
allegations are coming up right so in our view is that right if there is any discrimination uh, it needs to be outright condemned rejected and it needs to be addressed right? there is no space uh, civilized society does not have any space for discrimination of any kind so that i have said that what we are worried about is vested interest using the caste discrimination issues or narrative to peddle a fake narrative against brahmin community that is one part of the story the second is there is this thing called critical race theory which uh, i think one of the core tenets of that seems to be that uh, that a person uh, because of the systemic racism which uh, which prevails which they talk about a person may not necessarily be racist but he may anyway he or she may make choices which might actually fuel racism and there is i think attempts to kind of bring in a critical caste theory they call it so if we go by that definition so what it means is a person may not may not be casteist but by doing certain actions they may or may not uh, they may un- un- uh, unconsciously they may actually fuel casteism so if that theory kind of takes prevalence then what happens right then a person how will they make any actions because any of their actions can be put into a microscope then right? unwittingly if we say that even uh, unconsciously or subconsciously they may do thing how how do we kind of ever find that out it looks like one huge conspiracy theory to us right if we start putting it then what happens is it kind of fractures the society because people have to be very guarded in their actions and reactions and others then there is this it's an oppressor oppressed narrative that is what the race theory is all about critical theory is about whereas the indian civilization the bharatiya civilization is not a rights based civilization it's a duties based civilization so some of this false narrative has come here about uh, uh, the brahmin hate and others so if we allow that narrative to take in then the next logical step is it will start af- affecting globally which we are already seeing evidence of it there are ca- cases which are being put on where a person says he is not a believer in the, the caste system or other but still they get attacked for it right so this kind of st- issues start happening yeah the uh, the case with the equity labs is obviously very well organized uh, you know campaign to to oppress and to uh, harass the brahmin specifically and uh, the so called upper castes in uh, in north america in us uh, and uh, poor people i mean they left this uh, country in search of greener pastures in search of better opportunities and in away from the discriminatory policies of the indian state and now they find themselves face to face with the same problem there also because they might have run pro- from the problems but the problems are not running away they are staying and uh, with the kind of uh, the kind of position that the indian state holds with respect to caste caste discrimination reservations etc uh, i think that it is very unfortunate that even when you are no longer a citizen of india you still carry that burden because the indian state legitimizes that discourse through its policies and through its own laws so it's very unfortunate and uh, although you've not gone into that much detail in your book on that particular case but i think that you know maybe a follow up book on that would be very relevant because this is truly taking global proportions now <clears throat> i would in when you mentioned equality labs we have kind of talked about one particular episode of that where we talk about the holy narrative being kind of read into as some kind of a discriminatory angle into that mm. but then we have pointed out that uh, what they are talking about as one ashura is actually the son of a respected brahmin sage and the entire gotra of brahmins trace their lineage to that uh, sage right mm. so why would brahmins uh, if they were uh, having this kind of uh, agenda to kind of uh, discriminate or victimize against others why would they put their own sage's son as that mm. person right so we have kind of uh, explained that we have not gone into a detailed analysis as such on how the other points of equality lab is definitely i think this is one thing which our uh, a uh, diaspora brothers have also reached out brothers and sisters for the matter that uh, they need a counter narrative in terms of civilizational counter narrative today is it happening from the indian state 
we don't see much evidence of that in terms of is there a civilizational state understanding and is there a civilizational response but uh, there is a uh, attack coming very organized especially from academic circles as well so we need to have a multifaceted approach to bring up a counter narrative we are doing our part we are doing as www.subterishi.org we are doing our part into that uh, but we we need more uh, kind of people to come in and then we need a multidisciplinary approach into this to combat this uh, and then not just to combat fake narrative but i think it is better to put out a clear counter narrative from uh, the indian civilizational perspective based on facts mm. not based on emotions but based on facts and primary research mm. Mm. that's our objective mm. did i answer your question yes yes um what i found to be a very effective way of driving home your point in the book is taking the example of uh india's official religion which is cricket <laughs> so uh so tell us something about that uh, and as we're moving towards the end of the end of the conversation i think this particular uh, chapter i found very interesting uh, about how they are uh, alleging uh, caste discrimination or brahmin domination even in a in a popular sport like cricket which is you know which everyone participates in great uh, thanks for bringing that up because um, what we did was and it it when i was doing this research one point which came into my mind was there could be this argument or criticism that hey you have taken a few facts or you have taken some random events and you have stitched them together right and then to put a narrative out mm. but how do we know that it is not some random thing which you have taken uh, and then used it to your advantage because there could if you say it's like a corrupt plotting there are always some outliers we may be there this there so how do we know that this is a right frame of narrative so to what we did was we took some examples where we said in my view it was built brick by brick like how i explained the faces it is there is a clear pattern right do we see this clear pattern happening then i said let's put out that most popular sport which is the cricket in india so you see that there is a bra- uh, there is a base layer first foundational layer as they call it that was built quite almost like 10 15 years back to say this is some kind of a brahminical sport okay very good and right? what is so brahminical about cricket then you actually go and investigate that then you find that in the pre independent india there was not even a brahmin team there was a, there was a hindu team there was a, i think a parsi team and there was a, um, there was a islam muslim mm-hmm. team so they people were i think that time they were all having teams and as a convenient way of organizing as a religion nothing uh, wrong or right about it just they were working as brothers anyway right so they as brothers they were playing so are we saying that the, the pre independence era muslims and uh, parsis were also brahminical what is so brahminical about cricket So in the post-independent era, then with this narrative starts slowly, right? Somewhere in the 90s, that there is a Brahminical sport. Okay. Then there are justifications why Brahmins are playing it. Maybe because cricket is a non-contact sport. Right? So that's the next layer. So by the Brahmins' puritanical values, then where is the evidence? You know, I, last time I checked, uh, table tennis and tennis are also non-contact sports. <laughs> okay. So there is not much of a contact sport. and when i go back into the history i find that wrestling there is a uh, uh, there is a um, community by name jeshtamalla which we have documented in the book who were uh, wrestlers they are uh, lord krishna worshippers bhagwan krishna's uh, ardent follower devotees they have been uh, uh, wrestlers before right so where is this non contact thing came then there is another uh, person who writes later saying talking about uh, uh, which is uh, the brahmins uh, physic uh, and so they just uh, they don't knock to strain themselves something like that right about brahmins uh, they don't want to uh, they don't want to dive uh, you know compare them to other teams i said uh, where is this the fitness and brahmins okay so fitness and brahmins and then we see that uh, in uh, in uh, puri uh, jagannath kshetra there were bodybuilders who were uh, you know happen to be brahmins so there nothing that one community is strong or one community is not strong we don't want to attribute it but you see how the layers start building right from saying that uh, uh, brahmins then uh, you know brahminical then there is a physical thing there is a non contact sport so slowly starts building mm-hmm. right and one of the articles even quotes a <coughs> very famous person by name professor i think ram guha ramachandra guha mm-hmm. right 
and even even he has talked about something about why brahmins are taking up this game he has given this uh, thing thing it doesn't require much stamina something like that right so even his words i don't know whether he said it or whether he was misquoted but that was also used to construct another layer into that right mm. so people start building over and over into it to create that it has somehow become a brahmin dominated game right the question is let's take all that away in terms of the narrative building but are we saying that the indian government or the cricket association is having a bias if there is any evidence then people should take it up in the courts or people should take it up of the government not peddle a narrative like this that in a parallel that some maligning a community mm. right? so that i think it starts uh, kind of puts like a pressure tactic so in future what happens is if any community kind of comes up in one particular fear if they are showing that then it can always be called as they they are dominating they are getting an undue advantage if there is an undue advantage please bring it evidence on the table right mm. and bring it to our uh, law institutions we have robust constitution we have uh, robust judiciary there we have uh, uh, executive let's have trust in them and provide the document don't do this mass uh, media kind of hatred building campaign against a community that is our humble request mm-hmm. so one one final issue which uh, of concern to us is that any sport or any uh, any industry or even any uh, vocation we should not look at people from the any particular lens either from a religious lens or from a community lens or from a caste lens i think it should be avoided because if we look at cricket uh, when we look at uh, our uh, famous icons like uh, shri gavaskar or shri sachin tendulkar or shri rahul dravid or <coughs> shri mohinder amarnath ji or shri bishan singh bedi who was from the previous era right so all these icons and now we have uh, icons like shri irfan patan Uh, red was done a lot and recently i believe one cricketer has also come who is doing a lot and then uh, shri sachin sorry bumra some uh-huh. boom, uh, right so there are so many icons who are coming here i don't think we view them from their surnames or from their caste right every one of them is giving their prime youth in serving the country right it is not easy to get selected into a country of 1.4 billion people come into the team and then keep performing there and they give their best years into the service of the nation in a way they are also kind of bring being ambassadors into that in it kind of belittles their achievement if st- people start putting a casteist lens or a religious lens or a community lens into that right i think we should respectfully keep them as icon who our youth can follow and then say that in, in a 1.4 billion population or 11 people get selected and these people are coming and representing my country then i should have the faith in myself that i will also excel in that thing so that should be the level at which the discourse has to be and not start uh, kind of belittling the achievement of the people and that kind of brings in the overall discourse level down that is our view on it so uh, this is the this is the last question from my side <clears throat> that a good chunk of your book is about uh, action items Uh, appealing to the conscientious members of indian society saying that this is how it is and this is eventually the fire uh, erupted long time back and this is going to come to your door and that you need to do something about that so you've worked out a 10 step plan uh, of what ordinary people can do so a lot of our videos and Uh, our discourses on this channel uh people t- people always ask what do i do okay. so i think it's a on that good note of call to action if you can elaborate on this on that part of what that 10 point i agenda is and how how do people deal with that in their own personal life thank you i think the recent we put out that was uh, there are times when uh, we read a book and then we get a good concept then and then we understand that the problem description does happen then in the end then we are like are we, am i there is a high level discourse on what needs to be done but as an individual what can i do mm. right so that question we felt need to needed to be addressed so i was passionate about documenting some simple plans the 
the first thing about these plans is that it does not have to have a huge investment of money or a time or other because we realize that people have to be practical and uh, they can't spend a lot of time or effort so first is what we are saying is be aware of these issues right and two is find out how people are going to address it together right so awareness is the first critical step that there is a civilizational battle going on and without having any choice we are being part of that right and second is we watch out for hate speech and say more importantly responding to hate with hate is not an answer right so we need to find proper ways to address it third is especially to the brahmin community we say start, start staying go back into our our roots one way we have said is if you see the historically the first thing of the anushthanas we call it which went out for brahmins is the madhyanika we call it which is the afternoon uh, sandhya. sandhya vandana because in the earlier days uh, when people started going to work which is non uh, vaidik work the first thing was they were still able to do their morning and uh, sandhya vandana and then the evening sandhya vandana the afternoon became kind of a difficult thing then there was a small uh, uh, way forward which has worked which is that there is a sangama kala which is after 8:24 or 8:25 am depending on where the sun rises on that day one can finish it and still get to their office timing but nowadays 8:25 8:26 if somebody starts uh, doing that and then trying to reach a workplace in bangalore or uh, delhi i don't know how easy or tough it is right so so what happened is over a period of time that practice went away so what we are requesting is as first is the community should get together maybe in a in a temple uh, nearby place or in in a in a person's house and then start doing the madhyana uh, together maybe once in a month start with that as an appeal then that also brings in the community building as a community talk about the issues which are facing the community right it is not this meeting is not about talking about other communities or what issues are there that's to introspect on our community that should be the one and next is to also educate our younger generation about the traditions and values so this is this becomes a kind of a unifying place for them these are some of the steps we have seen and very importantly we need to work with a sense of urgency right that is also important because it cannot be that okay i will do this after one year i will do this after two year procrastination mm-hmm. is not going to help us and in that connection we have also come out with a petition for uh, challenging hate speech against brahmin community and uh, this petition is live on our website and i request you to kind of put it in the scroll down what they call it it's www.brahmingenocide.org and www.saptarishi.org again both these websites uh, there is no financial strings attached to this petition like no money need to be paid for anything no membership fees also it's a simple petition which asks for their email and uh, i think their uh, mm. na <clears throat> location something like that not not personal details are also not asked anybody above 18 can sign that in a family if there are four five they can if they feel they are convinced they can also see that this petition is in five languages we have kind of uh, translated it into five languages and there is a detailed description of what this petition is about along with some evidences which are there in the pdf also people can read, read through it and if they are convinced they can support this petition and also please share it with your friends and their relatives so that we can start building awareness about the brahmin hate speech issue and then start working towards systematically addressing it because we feel that we first need to approach our honorable courts and then try to use our constitutional mechanism and faith in our judiciary to kind of come and support us in this thing and supreme court honorable supreme court has recently said that hate speech should uh, state should have very strict action on that so when the honorable supreme court itself is having that kind of a view we should use this opportunity to go and uh, bring this issue of brahmin hate speech to the honorable uh, justices of the courts not just the honorable supreme court but even at the uh, honorable high court level we have to bring these issues to their attention and solve it that is our request and awareness again right? that is the fundamental thing being aware is the first step in kind of addressing the issue and that's our sincere request and again we pray to ishwara for uh, success to uh, not just this initiative but to all our uh, efforts and for all the bharatiya civilization and to your upward viewers also thank you thank you so much thank you so um, so i think the message is to the first step is to be aware yourself and to raise awareness 
in your circles and uh, do what you can to do to get to that stage. Absolutely. So thank you, Balaji, sir. Thank you for coming and spending uh, your precious time with us and answering these questions. And I hope that, you know, the book does well. Again, uh, to the viewers, Brahmin Genocide, the precursor to Hindu extinction. Uh, you can buy the book and uh, I'm sure that you will uh, you will be enlightened on this very important issue. Thank you very much. Namaste. Thank you, Ji. Thank you.